And the CNN website actually is very good because it talks about, you know, like the five or six things worldwide that you should know about. And it kind of encapsulates what's happening in the world from a macroeconomic point of view. So it's in that spirit of the importance of, of what's happening in, in the bigger picture that uh, I uh, had a, some great conversations with our guest speaker, and his name is Robert King, a senior economist and managing director of the Jerome Levy Forecasting Center in beautiful downtown Mount Kisco, New York. And I never knew that such a prestigious uh, institution and such a prestigious economist uh, uh, w would would be found in Mount Kisco, but you know, it, it's uh, it's a wonderful hey. thing when you make these uh, these discoveries. Uh, Mr. King is a senior economist, uh, as I said, at the okay. Jerome Levy Forecasting Center. Uh, since May of 2013, uh, he has he uh, joined the economic consultancy as a research analyst in 2007. Today, he is involved in managing and participating in the analysis and forecasting of all aspects of the economy, and he also continues to follow housing as a particular specialty. He was the key figure behind uh, the Forecasting Center's warnings about the inability of the U.S. housing market to manage a satisfactory recovery uh, during the 2009-2014 so-called expansion. He has studied and written extensively on this as well as other, uh, uh, other areas related to uh, the macroeconomy, profits, investment, employment, financial markets, etc. Before the Jerome, during the Jerome Levy Forecasting Center, he served on the board of directors of the New York Public Interest Research Group and conducted research at Patterns for Progress in Newburgh uh, and, uh, and on regional affordable housing in the Hudson Valley. He's a graduate of the State University of New York at New Paltz, where he received a, a degree in economics and the Seishu Memorial Scholarship and a BA degree in International Economics. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to try to buttonhole him and tell, have him tell me the, 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 the real deal on the, the prospects for Italy. I'm very interested in Italy. <laughs> he is a member of the National Association for Business e uh, Economics and the New York Association for Business Economics. So without further ado, uh, and by the way, that's only part of his credentials. He's, you know, you know, he's, he's got credentials up the kazoo. But seriously, he's a great guy. I had the pleasure. I had the pleasure. No questions, him. I had the pleasure of, uh, of of meeting him on the phone several times, having great conversations. And it's nice to meet him in person. Please give Mr. Mr. Lee, Mr. Mr. Lee, I'm okay. Mr. King, a warm welcome. my kings and levies mixed up. That here. is wonderful. And thank you for having me here. Uh, Albert asked us to provide a mid-year review of the economy and the business sector. My thoughts were to anticipate your first question is, why should you care? Why does the macro economy matter? Hopefully I'll provide some perspective on that tonight. But after all, the mantra is that all real estate markets are local. Indeed, some of what I'm going to say tonight, when we're going to look at broad national and global economic trends, some of this may be reflected in your local markets and some may not. But I think we've all seen enough to know in recent years that the macro economy may not seem to matter much until it's the only thing that matters. So we're going to look ahead at what matters in the macro economy. I thought we'd motivate it a little better this way. Few thought that U.S. housing was capable of taking down the global economy. And the question is now, could China actually take down the U.S. housing recovery, such that it is? We'll start with a couple things you might be reading about, listening about, and we'll assess some of the risks out there. First up, let's talk about things not to worry about. From our outlook, inflation, you may hear about it a lot. It's always talked about by economists. Inflation is quite low at the moment, and the forces are in place for it to continue to be low for the foreseeable future. A pickup inflation is not something that you need to worry about over the next 6 to 12 months. Here's another thing. This might be a little more surprising. There's a lot of talk about interest rates moving sharply higher. 
there's the Fed is supposedly on the cusp of starting this tightening cycle. The outlook I'm going to provide tonight is going to suggest that the Fed will probably be restrained from tightening rates aggressively, from raising them aggressively, perhaps restrained from raising them at all, depending on the timing. And regardless, rates at the long end of the curve, which is probably more what you're concerned about in terms of mortgage rates, are likely to stay within what is a historically very low range for the next time being. But what are the risks you need to worry about in the near future? The chief risk that we see going forward is signs of accelerating global weakness. The U.S. is not doing great, but it is stable and it is growing. But meanwhile, there are pretty serious imbalances in the rest of the world that are enough to cause problems over there that will come back to bite the United States. These are problems that might show up in employment, show up in weakening trends in employment and incomes, which matter for people's ability to buy houses, pay their rent. And of course, there's the potential for financial market disruptions, tighter lending conditions. So one thing to keep in mind is the red flags you want to watch for are not necessarily signs happening that the U.S. economy is just going to fall into recession all by itself. What you need to be paying attention to is what's happening in the rest of the world and look for signs there of trouble that will eventually come out here. We'll start with just a few of the forces at work in the national housing market. Again, I look at broad national trends and we'll see which of these apply to you and which may not. But in the broad national housing market, we've seen a relatively weak recovery. This housing market is constrained by some corrections in long-term imbalances, which have been going on for a few years and which unfortunately still continue at the moment. This process is relatively stable at the moment, but we know that it can encompass some periods of turmoil that are unpleasant. Another thing that we see on the national market is that housing is generally still expensive. When we look at a long history, we look at a broad perspective of how housing is relative to other prices in the economy, relative to incomes, it is not particularly cheap, not particularly affordable. So this is a constraint. We're in a period of record low mortgage rates, but I think we've seen in the last few years that that's not quite been enough to spur a really strong housing recovery. And I think the first two points, which we're going to go into in more detail, will explain a little bit about why that is. Why mortgage rates, have, they are supporting housing, but they are not supporting a strong recovery in housing. And again, the red flags we want to watch for are risks from abroad, and we'll talk about that more. I need to step back just a moment and explain a little bit about how we look at the economy at the Jerome Levy Forecasting Center, uh, because we do do it in a slightly different way than a lot of other economists. But I think it's something that the people in this room can relate to. Our namesake at the Jerome Levy Forecasting Center was a businessman 100 years ago who looked at his own profits and realized that's what mattered to him when he decided whether he was going to hire more workers or whether he was going to expand his operations. He guessed that this was probably true of the economy overall. That is, more profits happen, there's going to be more jobs and more economic growth. So he set about a way to answer this question of how much, what is the total amount of profits that all business is creating in the economy? Um, a lot of people here are business owners yourselves, you already know that profits matter. Um, but what Jerome Levy discovered when he was looking at total profits is that the calculation was a little different. When he was looking at his own profits, he's taking his revenues, he's subtracting his costs, and he has his profits there. But he realized that the cost to his business often were revenue streams for other businesses. Um, so a lot of those net out. So when you're looking at the total amount of profits, it turns out to be something different. Here's what, here's what it comes down to, and it's something that as builders and managers of real assets, I think people in this room probably understand. When you construct a new asset, a house, a 
parking lot, a shopping mall, you're creating something of lasting value, something that generates income streams into the future. And in a sense, you are making the entire economy richer. Now, we can say that this way. Investment generates new wealth for the economy. That wealth flows around. Some of it ends up in the hands of households. Some of it ends up in the government coffers. Some of it ends up in the hands of foreigners. But what is not saved by those other sectors flows to business in the form of profits. So this is the essence of the profits equation that Jerome Levy found 100 years ago. Investment generates new wealth. Some of that wealth flows into profits. Profits, in turn, do motivate business on a national scale to hire workers, to expand their operations. In turn, they drive economic growth. So that's why this is the focus of what we do, is to try and gauge total profits in the economy as a measure of the health of the business sector and the direction that the economy is going. <laughs> and one final point on this is that these are all financial decisions. You know, uh, a lot of what you hear about in economics is these measurements of goods and services. We're talking about dollar amounts that businesses earn, financial decisions. These are affected by financial markets, by interest rates, by levels of indebtedness, by asset valuations. And those financial markets and these financial decisions, in turn, affect the real economy, affect jobs, and affect um, economic growth. So if investment is the key to generating wealth in the economy, the first question that comes up is, why is investment in the US economy so weak? Here's a picture of it. This is the total amount of fixed investment, the total amount of construction, the total amount of uh, purchases of equipment and software, research and development, and intellectual property, all the investment in new fixed assets in the economy, all scaled to the size of the economy's output, GDP, which is also conveniently a measure of the economy's income. Yes? What are the units of your axes there? Uh, the lower axis is years. That begins in 1950. And it goes through the latest data point is quarterly in Q1 2015. Um, so investment generates new wealth in the economy. We can see this does fluctuate around, around periods of recession that are measured in gray. But throughout this entire recovery, it has been at its lowest level since World War II, persistent. And even right now, after this recovery, it remains low. So why is investment so low, this wealth creator, this key profit source? The, the quick answer is a broad economic pattern across the US of overcapacity and over-indebtedness, financial problems that are affecting the real economy. Investment needs to generate these returns in order to justify itself. You, you all know this. You know you, you have a property that you manage. Maybe you can sell it for more. Maybe you'll sell it for less. But in the meantime, the value of that property comes down to what kind of income is it generating. So investment is great. But if investment grows too fast and builds up too many assets too quickly relative to the income that the economy is generating, then it's not sustainable. Housing provides us, unfortunately, a perfect example of this. This is a measure of the total number of residential housing units in the United States scaled to the number of households. Now, there's not really a particular reason why we should have more housing than the number of households. These things grow together. But we can see that it did pick up quite rapidly uh, during the late 90s and 2000s. And eventually, there's too much housing relative to the number of households and importantly to the income that those households are producing. And so there needs to be some sort of correction. And we can see that it's come down, but this correction is still very much at work now, even seven years into this recovery. The same goes for prices of assets. Again, these prices of assets have to be justified by the income they earn. Here we have a measure of real home prices, that is, home prices compared to other prices in the economy over the past 110 years. We can see here that home prices grew much more rapidly than other prices in the economy. And indeed, they had to come back down quite rapidly in the most recent period. Essentially, home prices have to move in line with other prices over a prolonged period. They can 
move faster or slower at some times, but eventually they need to come back into balance. And finally, the other side of investment is that investment is often financed by debt, the taking on of new debt, and that debt in turn also needs to, of course, be serviced by the income that those assets generate. So here we have debt of not, this is not just housing anymore. This was a broad pattern that happened not just in the housing sector, but across the U.S. economy. We see that debt of households and non-financial businesses grew faster than the U.S. economy starting from the mid-80s. There was a sharp acceleration in this. And this is scaled to GDP, the income that the economy is producing. Debt rose much faster than this. Eventually, we reached a point where there was too much stock of assets generating less and less returns. Asset prices were falling and collateral values were falling. Debt has to contract as well. And we can see that this is a process that's very much still at work in the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy is still in the midst of these broad, long-term corrections. Now these can involve, as I said, periods of turmoil, 2008, where asset prices are plummeting, debt is being written off left and right, and banks are failing. Or it can be more like the current period, which is quite stable. In a sense, we're waiting for the income generated by the economy to catch up with these things. Debt can grow, house prices can grow, construction can happen, but they need to grow at least in line with incomes and probably a little slower than incomes over the next few years. So the U.S. is correcting its imbalances over a long period of time, but it is happening and that does eventually lead to higher returns on these assets. But in the meantime, what we've seen is that similar types of imbalances have exploded across the globe. So while the U.S. has been correcting things, other parts of the economy have been going in the other direction. Here is just a 25-year history of what we were just looking at, the U.S. debt ratio. U.S. debt scaled to GDP or its income. We see it's coming down. Here's what's happening in China. Now we know what they say about a butterfly flapping its wings in China, that there are consequences elsewhere. The butterfly is flapping its wings. There's been extraordinary debt growth in China. We can see actually in the last 10 years, debt relative to the size of their economy has grown more in the past 10 years than what the U.S. did over 25 years or even longer. This is an extraordinary amount of debt growth. And what it tells us is not necessarily when, you know, not necessarily how, but that there will be some type of correction coming in China where this debt has to get realigned with incomes. Again, we don't know exactly when that will happen or how it will play out. It won't necessarily be, yes? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I think we'll need time for questions. I spend a lot of time talking to other economists, so if it seems like I'm speaking in tongues, um, hopefully we can clear that up at the end. But what we can say about uh, uh, Chinese corruption is that the past investment that was financed by this debt is likely not generating the returns they expected. It is instead taking the form of excess capacity and it is excess debt that needs to be realigned. As the returns on that investment decline, there's less motivation for new investment and it's just not profitable. The massive investment machine that drives the Chinese economy is likely to slow. And what we learned from the profits equation is that as investment slows, profits slow. Chinese economy. There will be debt problems as, as these returns fall, and some of that debt will be in the hands of Chinese banks, some of it might be for foreign investors, some of it might be taken on by the government. And we can also clearly say that China is the second largest economy in the world, and there will be global repercussions of a Chinese correction. China has a massive force in global trade flows is very significant in commodity prices and also has a significant presence in financial markets that globally financial markets are very much integrated and are affected by what happens in China. Let's take a look at how this is playing out 
This is Chinese fixed investment in their construction, in their equipment, in their intellectual property. If you look at the scale on the left, this is scaled to the size of their economy. Fully half of their economy is built on just producing new fixed assets that are hoping to generate returns. This has always been very high in China, but it's picked up in recent years. It's a very rapid pace of investment that's going on. But what are the returns that it's generating? A lot of China's economy has been built on exporting to the rest of the world. Here we have a picture of their exports on the brown line. And here we've just taken a line, followed the trend of what was happening for the 20, 30 years um, prior to 2007. Now, things were growing very fast. This is not necessarily how they should have grown, but it does give you a sense of what the expectations were at that period in time when they were undertaking lots of this investment in the assets that they've put in place now. There were great expectations for Chinese growth to continue going at a very rapid pace. And even as exports have continued to grow, they are not meeting those expectations. So the returns on those past investments are just not there. What does that mean? It means that China has rampant excess capacity across its, uh, across its economy. You hear about ghost cities. I mean, there are ghost factories, ghost auto plants, ghost steel mills things that are built and are just not needed. This is a broad measure put together by the IMF of capacity utilization, just saying, of the fixed assets in your economy, how much are you putting them to work? How are you making stuff out of them? We can see that in the 1990s, China had a capacity utilization rate of 90%. That is, 90% of their assets were being put to use. That is a very high rate that justifies lots more investment. You need more assets because you're using up the ones that you have. But you also see that just in the past 10 years, there has been this extraordinary decline. And unfortunately, the IMF didn't update this data. It only goes through 2011. But we know that China was continuing to increase its investment. And we know that the Chinese economy has continued to slow over that period. So it's fair to say that this has declined further. And again, China is basically only using half of its capacity at the time. The rest is just a waste. And the debt that financed that is not going to be serviceable because it's not generating any returns. So just to put this in perspective, here's a long history of what's been going on in US manufacturing. There are major swings in capacity utilization that have a big effect on our economy. But the moves in China have been from higher highs to lower lows in a more rapid time than anything we saw, including the past Great Recession. So what's happening in the Chinese economy is a big deal. The U.S. will not be immune to it. You know, the U.S. exports a lot to China. As those exports slow, you have slowing investment in U.S. export industries, and you have slowing job growth in those industries and loans that are going to China and to other emerging markets dependent on China will begin to perform more poorly and financial markets will be disrupted and there's a potential for a tightening of lending conditions here as well. So with that in mind, let's go back to looking at U.S. housing. U.S. housing, as I mentioned, is constrained by some of these long-term imbalances. The housing stock, and again, I, I focus my energies on the national level. You know, this is not necessarily what you're seeing, but maybe you're seeing some of this here. The housing stock, the level of housing prices, and the level of housing debt in the economy is still too large relative to incomes and has to, can rise, but has to grow at a pace slower than the, the rest of the economy in order to be sustainable. As I mentioned, we believe that mortgage rates are unlikely to move substantially up. They remain supportive and will remain at these low levels. In the meantime, though, if you care about these month-to-month -month moves, they are having a big impact. Even as we move within this very low range, we see housing react to that on a national level. But the chief risk is to be watching for these red flags overseas. If you're hearing about disruptions to the Chinese stock market, which is its own other animal, you know, or problems in Korea and Brazil, do not be thinking that these are thousands of miles away and they don't affect us because the global economy is integrated and very dependent on them. 
as I mentioned, there's a potential for financial market disruptions, which can tighten lending conditions here, and potential for weaker employment, particularly in export industries to start. One other trend that's going on in the national housing market, and perhaps you're seeing some of it here, is what is referred to as a two-tiered market, which I'll break down, I'll oversimplify as saying that in the single-family market, things are geared towards bigger, more expensive homes, whereas there are smaller, there's a large demand out there for smaller, more affordable homes in the multi-unit market, and the middle tier is kind of mediocre, it's not doing as well. So let's look at these corrections. We looked at total debt in the U.S. economy. Here is just mortgage debt, household mortgage debt as a percent of disposable personal income. We saw this is scaled to the income. This is the income that services that debt. This is not a figure like other figures you see. GDP can grow forever. Things scaled to GDP and income cannot grow forever. You know, they, they have to stay in some sort of balance. There might be reasons for some things, but we can see that the forces it took, it took for debt to grow so rapidly in such a small period of time, we know those forces that were at work. Extremely easy lending conditions, extremely bullish sentiment on house prices that never go down and always go up. Those things are very difficult to replicate just because we want it to happen again. It won't necessarily. We've seen very consistently mortgage debt continues to not necessarily decline outright, but to grow at least more slowly than the level of income until these things slowly over a period of years get back in balance. This is payments. These are the actual mortgages themselves, the amounts. This is outstanding mortgage debt. And as a matter of fact, this is put together by the Federal Reserve. It also includes HELOCs and home equity loans. So yes, not all of this needs to be paid all at once, but it's just a, it's just a measure that it, these things need to be gauged relative to each other. I, indeed, there's no way of necessarily knowing what level causes problems. I think what you have to look at is the state of markets and the state of the economy that were needed to generate this. And I think what we saw were such extremes that showed us that this wasn't a natural thing for it to do, but instead was just brought about by extremes in the market sentiment. House prices, we looked at this chart before. Um, again, they are growing right now, and they are growing faster than other prices in the economy. But it is difficult to say that housing is cheap relative to the rest of the economy. Um, in fact, over the past 110 years, we, we've stayed here even um, at its low point in the beginning of 2012, at the bottom of this most recent market, it was still at the high end of this historical range. Housing never got to a, an especially cheap level. And I would argue, House prices can continue to rise, but they need to grow in line with incomes and other prices in the economy. We can see this. This is another picture of how this is working out. Here, instead of looking at total income, we're just looking at the income of full-time workers aged 25 to 34. Um, so this is our prime first-time home buyer, the one we're waiting for. Here we have two measures. We have home prices on the brown line, and we have rents scaled to their earnings. A lot of people will focus on rent seem to be a lot higher um, scaled to earnings compared to home prices, and perhaps that means relatively that uh, younger people would like to move um, from being renters to homeowners. But if we look at each of these relative to its own history, outside of that housing bubble, these are both elevated. Uh, and, whether they're renting or owning, um, their incomes are constraining them from necessarily driving a robust recovery because both of them are elevated. So shelter affordability is a problem for young workers. Yeah, let's look at interest rates here. Steve, can I ask a question? Of course. Going back to the, the incomes, is the debt that many young people are carrying due to education a factor of that, or is that not factor? Uh, that would, no, this is their earnings before they service any other debt. 
So yeah, some of their earnings would have to go towards student loans. Um, in terms of the outstanding amount, student loans have grown much more rapidly, but at say a trillion dollars are still a pittance compared to mortgage debt. Um, but they, they, they are a major factor for, for young people. Here we have a measure of total amount of home sales, single family home sales, we're not talking about multi unit here, and we're comparing them to interest rates. I mean, one thing that you can see right away is that these move inversely. Interest rates go down and, and home sales tend to get a boost and interest rates go up very high like they did in the early 80s and home sales tend to be depressed. But what we've noticed is that even as mortgage rates have come down to very low levels, their, their lowest levels in the post-war period, that has not spurred a particularly strong recovery in home sales. And again, I would argue that these other financial factors, the measures of debt, the overall trend in housing prices, and the overall amount of housing stock are playing more of a factor, as well as tighter lending conditions compared to previous times. As a matter of fact, if we look at what happened during the housing bubble, you can see that interest rates, a lot of people say, oh, interest rates were just too low and they spurred this huge housing bubble. Interest rates did come down to new lows, but it doesn't appear from this chart that interest rates were responsible for the surge in home sales that we saw. I think other financial factors were in play. The ability to get a mortgage was not just about the interest rate. And of course, this is an interest rate on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which was, um, still the most common during the housing bubble, but less common than, than usual. And right now it is more, more of the average measure. But like I mentioned, in the, in the near term, interest rates do matter. Interest rates are staying in its low range. We don't expect them to rise further. We can see this is just since 2010, and the interest rate on the right scale is modulating between 5% down to a low of, of less than three and a half percent. And we see that home sales do respond to that. These, these relatively small fluctuations do play a bigger part. And part of that's basic math that at lower levels of interest rates, it, the change in the mortgage payment that you can afford if mortgage rates just go up 50 basis points is, is actually a greater change uh, at say a 2% mortgage rate than a 10% mortgage rate. That's just the mathematics of how that works. But in any case, we've seen that when mortgage rates plumb new lows, home sales get a boost. And when they rise back up a bit, we see that home sales tend to stall a little bit. Over the past year, mortgage rates have again come down and home sales have begun picking up. If you've monitored financial markets over the past few weeks, you know that mortgage rates have risen again and are a little bit north of 4% again, and we can see that that already kind of weighs on the weekly mortgage applications that the Mortgage Bankers Association puts out. So day to day, week to week, these interest rates do matter, but again, they're going to remain broadly supportive. Interest rates are not the major problem in housing. One more thing that I mentioned, that. This is a little bit on that two-tiered market. Again, these are national figures, but these are the median square footage of new units under construction. We see two trends here. For single unit structures, single family homes, the, the median square footage is at an all-time high. And what we're not showing here is that the prices are actually at an all-time high, too. New home construction is increasingly geared in the national economy towards the higher end. That's where it's been that we're building bigger, more expensive homes. But what I find particularly interesting is that for multi-unit homes, the exact opposite has happened over the past 10 years, is that they're getting smaller. And this says to me that the opportunities are there, again, at the ends of the spectrum. Uh, there's a limited number of pretty lucrative opportunities servicing high-income households, and there's a large demand at the low end for affordable housing. And in the middle, So I'm just going to wrap up here. I just want to review some of the key takeaways. Again, the US economy is stable on its own. The red flags we want to watch for are from overseas, not just in China, but in Europe. Pay attention to what's happening over there. And if you see those signs, 
do not think that the U.S. economy is going to be immune. Sometimes you hear the word decoupled. And what happens there doesn't affect us here. That's never proven correct, but it's especially not so right now. One thing to be aware of is that we have seen influxes of foreign buyers. I believe on the national market, the U.S. national market is big enough that foreign buyers are not enough to really drive the trends, but certainly in some local markets, um, particularly the West Coast and particularly in top tier cities such as New York City, we do see that influence. We see a large demand from foreign buyers. And if there are, is a potential for greater weakness overseas, that demand might be some of the first canary in the coal mine to show you some signs of weakness. And of course, I'm sure you're aware that there are knock-on effects, spillover effects from what happens in New York City that trickle on up through the suburbs. That people who are selling their homes to Chinese buyers in Manhattan sometimes move up to White Plains. Um, and of course, this, this last point is you know, dependent on your own business uh, and your own tolerance for risk, but if you do see signs of weakness overseas, then it, it is a time to be ready to be conservative. That means different things for different people. For bigger firms, it might mean trimming back inventories. For, for smaller firms, it might be more just about taking on projects with a shorter duration. And for everyone, kind of being prepared for the potential for lending conditions to get a little tighter than how we go. And once again, the things that we don't need to worry about necessarily are a sharp pickup in inflation or necessarily a pickup in interest rates, though you will hear about them every day in the newspaper and on the radio. Um, so I hope this is helpful. I, I, I'm here to answer any questions and explain my strange tongue. And uh, I will just mention that we do have some of our research on what we're looking at posted that you can see for free up on our website if people well, are um, gluttons for punishment. We'll take some questions. And uh, when you ask a question, please stand and uh, articulate and project. So uh, Mr. Mullen was the first to uh, stand up. So Carl? You think the situation in Greece, which looks to me like it's not going to be good, uh, will affect the American economy, affect, I mean, what you're saying, global markets. Yeah. Well, again, to the extent the European economy will affect the, the U.S. economy and the global economy. <coughs> to what extent Greece will disrupt the European economy, I'm not sure. But what we can say is that the European economy has broadly faced a lot of the same pressures that the U.S. has. They had a massive run-up in debt, too, in businesses and households. And because of the structure of their economy, they actually haven't been as aggressive on writing off that debt. They just weren't able to allow the banks to take those losses. So that debt is sitting out there, and they have what you might call zombie conditions in bank lending. And they're probably going through a longer period of adjustment than the US is. Uh, again, it's a stable period at the moment, there are potential for these kind of things to blow up at times. I, I think we're in a period where there's greater than normal potential for financial disruptions, in this case triggered by Greece. Um, but I think one way of thinking it, of it is that Europe is facing a lot of these same long-term pressures of overcapacity and over-indebtedness, and that's going to be their chief restriction, and that's going to be the chief problem behind problems in public finances that are really a reflection of what's going on in the rest of the time. Uh, we, have a, we have a guest, uh, an intern with Julian Farns, Thomas yeah, Brown, uh, Shanghai, also, China, right? I'm from Shanghai, China. I'm also uh, I'm a student of Florida, uh, the Valley School of Business. And uh, I agree everything you say pretty much. And uh, I just want to add a couple okay. points to the China aspect. I actually did a credit research on China last summer. Uh -huh. uh, and, and an investment company last summer. And uh, they are adjusting now. You know, Look at the GDP data. Last year was 7.4, right? The, the year before was about 7.8, and uh, before that was like 9 percent or something. So they were slowly trending down their GDP growth trajectory. And some argue these numbers are a little bit wrong. So they could be growing at 6.5 percent, but they are telling the 
the general public, especially Chinese, therefore, has some percent. Just to give them more confidence. As the government always try to add a little bit more, you know, to their to their policies or data or information to their system, because you know we have to think about it. It's a 1.4 billion population country, so you know any big big economic uh, fluctuation will create some kind of social uh, turmoil. So you know their biggest task is to is to make sure people are working. So employment is the major issue in China. So, so therefore, what they are doing is they're cutting, slightly cutting rates, gradually cutting rates, uh, which they have quite a lot of room because you know interest rate right now is still about 4.5 percent uh, lending rates in China. So they still have a lot of room to cut rates, um, and they will slightly you know, trend down their lending. They will continue loose, and they're going to lend less. So you know we're going to see a still going to see growth, but they're going to be way more slower than they were in 2000 until 2010, that period. And, and also we have to look at what happened during that period of time. And there was the Olympics, there was the, ex at the, the Shanghai Expo, so they were building a lot of these infrastructures, try to make sure the world know, you know China is growing and they're becoming better. And they're attracting a lot of foreign capital, a lot of foreign companies to China to invest in them. So that's why we saw a lot of debt in that period of time. And these debt will probably will not be paid back in for a long term. So what the government will probably do is to refinance them. You know, they will cut the rates, let the company refinance them or write write down some of the some of the debt in the banks. Because the banks, most of the major four banks or big banks are owned by the government. The government has a major stake in them. So they will say, okay, well, you guys take some losses. We will take some losses and the public will take some losses. And then we will slowly, slowly absorb these losses and and so so the economy wouldn't have a major shock or recession. That's the major issue. They don't want to have a recession. Of course. Um, and, and they no one does. If they have a recession, you know, something they're gonna have they are gonna have bigger problems deal with the social aspect than the economic one. Yeah. Very right. thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, if I may just interject uh, just a couple of, of points. Uh, you you uh, you focused on China. Uh, what about the other economic? Just very briefly, what about the other economic in, in the BRIC? Uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, and India. A absolutely. Uh, we focus on China because it's it's right. one so of the more extremes, yes. uh, of course, <laughs> and because it's the second largest economy in the world. But the broad trends are not as extreme, but are similar in a lot of the other emerging markets. That while the developed markets, as we mentioned, Europe. The U.S., the U.K. have been bringing debts down because they had a long period of, of debt growing and over leveraging. The emerging markets have been increasing their leverage pretty rapidly during this time. And so, again, where those limits are for each individual economy is very different. As, um, as you mentioned, China actually has probably more policy levers to play with than a lot of other emerging markets that are unfortunately just at the mercy of financial markets. They can't necessarily cut rates or run big budget deficits if the currency markets tell them that they're not going to accept that, whereas China can. Um, but generally these, these problems in terms of rising leverage and in terms of capacity rising and investment being very rapid scaled to the growth in that economy is very widespread around the world. We have another question, yes. Uh, the young lady in the back there. Oh, uh, um, the jury is Valerie, and the jury is still out for me whether or not I will invite you to my next dinner party based on this information. <laughs> a little disconcerting, uh, but very well stated. So, um, question. You know, the United States created a false economy during that period of time of excessively free lending. And it looks like China, which is such a huge market, is, is almost down on that same path. I mean, especially talking about the capacity of some of the fixed assets and what they're actually using. So we're paying the piper. It looks like China will pay the piper. It has to in time, but it seems like they have a few more controls over that. Um, but in, it's said in the US that a lot of our corporations are sitting on a ton of cash. And it's because there's just so, things are so yeah. unpredictable around government regulations and what's going to happen perhaps in China and other markets. Um, is there any hope for them to not be so constrained and re, you know release some of that capacity to warm to heat up our our economy locally? Right. 
That, that's a very good question. And, and the situation in the business sector is a little different than the situation in the household sector in terms of debt. But there is a substantial debt load, even when you take into account cash on, on business balance sheets. But more broadly, as to what they're going to do with the, the cash, I mean, first of all, it's not evenly distributed across. We know that uh, a, a few mega companies kind of account for a big bulk of that cash when you're looking at it. But, but secondly, we have to decide that we can provide subsidies or cheap loans or accelerated depreciation and try all sorts of things or cut rates to try and get investment to go pick up. But investment ultimately these are financial decisions that these companies are going to make. What do I think my outlook is for my sales? And what do I think if I invest in a new asset, what are the returns it's going to generate for me? Um, that, that applies in China as well as in the United States. And, and eventually, when, when all the dust settles, that's what ultimately decides what the value of, of these assets is going to be worth. And so we've seen that companies have not really felt particularly confident about the growth outlook. And so investment reflects that. And there's not a lot necessarily that policy can do. What needs to happen is that slowly these long-term imbalances work out and then eventually you get to a situation where a company's looking at a planned investment and they're saying, wow, you know, like the prices of how these things have come down and the fact that no one else is investing now means that there is a great return that I can potentially have, even if I don't think the outlook is particularly great. So these kind of imbalances do eventually lead to a resurgence. You know, um, If we look at what happened after World War II in the United States, we had a period where no one was investing, and because everything was geared towards the war, we had a lot of people fearing that there was going to be another recession as soon we were going to fall back into the Great Depression as soon as World War II was over. But there was this need for investment and that there were these returns to be had. So it turned out that as you invested, you earned great returns and you had good yields. And that can create a thriving recovery for a long time, a long cycle, you know, more than just one period of up and down in, in a recession. If, if you're building up these investments and you have a need for it and the returns are there, then that is going to drive economic growth for a long time. Any other questions? Yes, Jared. Yes, um, in the uh, multifamily sector, especially not just in Manhattan, but in the outer boroughs, there's been a huge uptick in the prices that are being paid for apartment houses, and frankly, not in great areas. Um, we, the money we, it's coming from foreign areas, probably from China and other places. Why is it coming from there? Is it a function of, like you're saying, there's no place to put it because there's no capacity of building? When does it stop and how is it going to affect us here? It's, it's obviously outpriced a lot of the local investors that would normally do the investing in these areas. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, I think domestic problems in China will create a risk that that money dries up. but. I think even beyond that, that, that does influence these local markets, but there are broader forces at work in general across the economy. We see these low interest rates reflect there is a low return on assets. You're not getting a lot of yield no matter where you put it. And another way of saying that, when the return on assets is low relative to the value of the assets, assets are high relative to incomes, and, and, and the valuations are high, and that is true across a wide range of assets right now. Financial markets, equity markets, commercial real estate. Um, people are always looking for what's more relatively uh, relatively cheaper. You know, this isn't as bad as that, so I'm going to move into that. Um, as to when those things correct, I mean, our general take is that the chief risk, again, to the economy is from overseas that the U.S. economy will continue to thrive and as, or continue to grow in the near term if left alone. And if you're still growing, then you can continue to play that game where you keep bidding on assets because there's potential that your expectations for future growth and future returns might, might just keep rising. But eventually, again, I think the risk is going to come from when we see weakness in the economies 
of other countries because that will end up being weakness in the domestic economy and in that period of time then you get a reset where people have to in some ways as she said pay the piper and, and assets have to come back in line. Jean. What is the effect of China's economy on the United States national debt? This scares me. China is a big buyer of U.S. government debt and uh, a buyer of, as we've seen, uh, a number of other U.S. assets. One of the things we see is China has built up a lot of savings. It has to put them to work in some ways. And across the globe, people do want to invest in the United States. Part of that is just because we've managed to have some sort of relatively stable growth for a long time. And plus, we have strong institutions that we've proven again and again when it comes down to it, we'll, we'll stand behind and, and keep the financial system from utter collapse, you know? So there's a sense of stability in the U.S. that few other countries around the world can match, and also a sense of, sense of size that attracts foreign capital. Lots of foreign capital flows into the United States. Lots of people flow into U.S. government securities because not just for the reasons I mentioned, but for financial markets, they are the benchmark. They are essentially the safe asset in the world. And over long periods of time, maybe someday it'll be different, but at the moment, you can't just change that. And so China stuck. You, you know, they say the, um, the thing is, like, uh, I owe the bank $1,000. I've got a small problem. I owe the bank $10 trillion. The bank's got a problem, right? Um, and in this case, you know, we owe China a lot of money, and that's really their problem. They cannot necessarily choose to get rid of that because because they are the ones that hold it and, it and it is their balance sheet you know it would create the losses for themselves if they decided to say we don't want to invest in treasuries and i think there'll always be a buyer for u.s government treasuries actually but but china has an interest and its interests are generally aligned with also having those securities be stable um, for its own reasons. We have time for a couple more questions. Hi, my name is Nami Kaur. Um, I'm hearing from some of my real estate friends and relatives in California and Florida that there is a lot of uh, demand by Chinese, not Chinese Americans, but people from China, to make investments here. Like they're just buying up a lot of properties. I'm wondering what that trend signifies. Is it because they have more investment in our real estate market vis-a-vis theirs? Yes. Um, well, it is interesting. I mean, the Chinese stock market is up 150% over the past year. So I can't imagine that all else equal, they wouldn't want to put their money there. Um, but so we have to wonder, in some sense, the way that China operates is, is a bit of a mystery to me. That's why I, I tried to lay out some of the big forces at work exactly how it plays out and whether this money is trying to flee China um, is one possibility or whether it's just these are people who have built up wealth and the US is always an attractive place to put that wealth it is another possibility as well um, it's it's hard to know exactly because the capital flows in some ways are restricted from China and it's not necessarily in some cases the Chinese government is sought to go into housing markets, say in Australia, where they know that their citizens have been buying property and try and track back that money, you know, because they want to know. But it, it is a bit of a mystery. I mean, all that I would say it signifies is that those markets, you know, might see a drop in demand if China's economy slows. But in any case, it's good for the Americans, right? <laughs> there we go. We actually, we actually, uh, Thomas, uh, actually, Thomas has a let's face it, he has an unfair advantage on the whole China thing because he's from Shanghai. Thomas, thirty seconds to clarify. If you well, well, here's the thing: they save about 40 50 percent income. The GDP is consistent of uh, 
investment in consumption, right? So in China, the consumption is about 40%, 45%, and it has been declining actually since the 2000s. So they save a lot of money, right? In the US, consumption is about 70%. So right. that extra 30% gives them a buffer to save money. And there, there simply wasn't a lot of investment options. The bonds market is completely shut off in China pretty much. It's owned by all the banks. So it's either the stock market or the property market. You know, and in the past five years, the property, uh, the property market has done extremely well because the stock market was crap. You know, it, it went from, at 07, it was highest around 5,500 points as uh, Shanghai, Shanghai stock economy, and went down to about 1,700 and was sluggish between, swinging between 1,700 to 22, 2,300, and then goes back and forth. So there was no liquidity there. There's no volatility in that stock market. So. You know they really have to invest in some other asset classes. So and, and a lot of kids are studying here, including me myself. Yeah. And so it would make sense for parents to buy some properties. And you know it's good investment in the U.S. because mm -hmm. property value has been going up. Uh, you know in the long term trajectory in the United States. It's, you know they say that economics is a dismal science, uh, but uh, Valerie, I'd have to disagree with you. I was kind of. Uh, actually uh, bolstered by this talk and a little bit more optimistic than I was coming into it. Uh, as you all know, you know, just to give you an idea of, of what I'm up against, uh, as a, I, I served as an uh, erstwhile economic advisor to my father. Mm -hmm. And my father is like pushing 90 from the old side from Italy. And he doesn't understand any of this. So, uh, so when we went through the crisis of, uh, of wage, uh, wage price freezes in the early 70s mm -hmm. and Nixon, he was all up in arms, and I, I calmed him down. I said, Pop, in the long run, it's going to even out. It's going to be fine. Yeah. And then we had the, the, the Jimmy Carter uh, interest rate increases, and he was all up in arms and, uh, you know, and yelling at the TV. <laughs> and I, I told him, Pop, you know, don't worry about it. In the long run, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> and this is kind of when, you know, when the stock market crashed 500 points under Reagan in 87. Yeah. He was all up in arms, and I, and I calmed him down. Okay, I know, Pop, calm him, calm him. Try not to feel okay. Don't worry about it. Finally, the last thing that, that almost did in it was the housing bubble of, of OA. Oh. But I said, Pop, oh, don't worry about it. I keep on telling you. And the long run, John Maynard Keynes once said, and he stopped me right there. And he says, a John and Maynard Keynes, he was stupid. You know what? In the long run, you die. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's exactly what, what John Maynard Keynes said. <laughs> and to which he replied, you know, you're stupid. You know? <laughs> so anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I really was uh, very, very encouraged by this, uh, not to worry so much about interest rates, not to worry so much about uh, the stuff that everybody else needs to be worried about. I'm still putting money in the mattress and uh, in the old Italian way. And, um, but do we have any other questions? Uh, I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, one more. Sylvia Slot. I read somewhere, I don't know how true it is, but one of the reasons why there's so much foreign investment is that the United States allows an individual overseas, they have $500,000, they invest in development, that they get a free green card, and the entire family gets a free green card. Is that true, or is that no. impacted? Or? Uh, I, I'm not sure about those, no, the, the necessary truth, but it would pretty much be the same thing, right? That people want to be a part of the United States. You know, People want to invest in the United States, and perhaps maybe you're saying, People might invest in the United States because they want to become a citizen of the United States. Uh, the, the U.S. is, is in some ways uh, attractive to much of the rest of the world. That's hopefully something that stays for, for many years to come. All right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you.